I am unashamed. What about you? We'll get Zach to do that. Yeah. Well, I think Hello, that. anybody out there? Can you hear me? We can't see you guys, but I know you're there. Uh, any unashamed Christians here today to join us? I guess we found the right place, Jay. Yep. For a second, I thought this was the soul coming to the big city, the big light. <laughs> <laughs> I want all. everybody to know I wore my best clothes. <laughs> I was about to comment on that. You and Jay's really dressed up for the occasion. Thank y'all for that. Um, you did change shirts, though, didn't you, Dan? I changed shirts. It's clean. <laughs> well, your other one was clean. It was just stained. It's just dirty looking. It, it made me think of the uh, that movie when he said, "How's it on stains?" Joseph, <laughs> <laughs> Joseph. Well, you people don't watch that. Six of you. I don't know what the rest of you pay for doing. That's why I wear camouflage when I go to the big cities because it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> if you're going to watch the Unashamed or listen to the Unashamed podcast, you have to watch Josie Wales. You're going to be lost all the time if you don't. Watch the TV version. I think that's PG. So, Jace, I noticed here on yours, um, yeah. did you cut these sleeves off yourself? Al's bringing this up because <laughs> on the way, my lovely wife is with us out there somewhere. And uh, I can't see because it's a big light. And so we get into, what would you call that? No, it wasn't a disagreement. I'm not sure what happened. I, it's, well, it, uh, I thought it was witty, witty banter. But witty then it banter. Turned, yeah. And she's like, why are you bringing that shirt? I was like, babe, this shirt brings me comfort when I go to big cities because I get nervous. There's, it's like a concrete jungle. So I know at any moment I can just take off running and find some woods and I'm in the camo. I know that's weird, but that's how my coping mechanism works. But she's like, well, you cut off the sleeves. I mean, that's just so, I was like, well, babe, when I was in an emergency situation, that's how I lost these sleeves. And she said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, I was in the woods. I had an emergency situation. <laughs> they don't sell toilet paper in the woods and she said will you use both of them at the same time i said no on two different occasions <laughs> she's like well what'd you do in between i said i rolled one of them up <laughs> so what's what's next what if, what if we have a third altercation well this is a size too big and so i've noticed I will start working from the bottom. <laughs> Welcome to the redneck mind. <laughs> well, they think I'm joking, but I'm dead serious. I, I, that's how it happened. Well, well, now seen, you know why people do that. I've seen you wear that before, and I didn't know there was that story. So he told me yeah. that on the plane. I said, well, I guess I know how we're opening the podcast. See, see, this is how the podcast works. You hear a story like that and you think people would probably be interested in knowing that someone on our podcast cut the sleeves off of their shirt to use the restroom, but then still wear the shirt. And like I personally the renounce the tearing off of your attire. I go with leaves. <laughs> well, here we <laughs> but go. But you, you have to know what type of leaves they are. <laughs> Don't go with any viney leaves coming off vines. Nope. <laughs> Overcup acorn seems to have the broadest leaf, so I find an overcup tree. <laughs> These people are in a big city, so I don't think this is helpful information. <laughs> but if you ever got in the woods, this would be good to know. Phil actually has a top three leaf. Like usage. a chart. Yeah, it's like a chart. Yeah. Because, it, you know, you think, well, what's the big deal? Well, you get one that has poison ivy on it and you've made things a lot worse yeah what, what i thought that was funny but... <laughs> <laughs> i ain't gonna say that i started to say something dad said before i'm not do it because uh, we're live today so i'm trying to behave and do a little bit better uh so zach is uh, it's good to have you back with us zach is uh he's kind of our fourth chair 
uh, when he's in town guy. And then sometimes he and I will zoom in together. Zach is my nephew. And I think Ron's he, he, nephew. <laughs> he was supposed to introduce us a while ago, but when he walked off stage, I'm not sure they that was aired. But I said, "Where was the altar call?" <laughs> <laughs> he was doing some live preaching. Was, that was a sermon. <laughs> yeah, I'm With, somewhat of a punching bag, right? Right. <laughs> well, speaking no, of that, actually, as well, I liked it. Okay. You know, I, can we get some coffee? Yeah, on we got, live we got TV coffee. Here, I, I don't know. You think it's uh, Black Rifle Cup? Well, I told him I met. Uh, a couple of really nice ladies in the green room that wasn't green, which was weird. But all right, rednecks can't figure out how no, to make this work. Push it down. Push it down. Push? Look, you get put the put. Yep. Put Start pushing. All right. See that lever? Oh, like this. I got it. No, no, That's... no. <laughs> there, there you go. go. There you go. Right, we go. There we go. Well, this is uh, fancy stuff here. Two weeks. So I. Well, I told him, I said, we're not going to drink this coffee and say that's too strong. I mean, this is BYOC. All right, let's try it. Bring your own coffee. I just now spotted my wife. Did I I do okay with that story? (laughs) She's shaking her head no. You know, one of the most fun times we had, I had, was when Missy was on the podcast and Jace was so nervous about it. Terrible. Uh, we we don't have anything in common outside of Jesus. She hates that when I say that, but it's just the truth. Yeah. People don't think we go together, and that's fine. Uh, but facial profiling is wrong. It should be addressed. But we both love Jesus, and guess what? That's enough. We've proven it. Yeah. Huh, babe? I thought somebody'd clap over that. But. <laughs> All right, so Dad, drink a little bit and tell us, is it, is it all right? I mean, I'm about looking at it, it's too weak. Well, <laughs> but Phil, compared to what you would have got had I not said, you're not going to make it too strong, it's drinkable. Yep. It, it's so funny because of the Robertson men, especially the older ones. We were at an event one time, and, and Cy was there, and somebody comes in, and they say, Cy, you know, we made this just for you, and I, don't, I can't even remember what it was, but he looked at it, and he took a bite, and he said, no. Nope. <laughs> And they were like, and he was like, is, is there something wrong with it? He said, no, nope, no good. <laughs> he just shoved it outside. I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, who does that? Well, Cy, si, he's crazy. <laughs> That's the number one question I get when I do events is, is Cy si really as crazy as he seems? And I always say the same thing. It's worse than you think. <laughs> I describe it like uh, an iceberg his insanity because you see that part that's above the water and it's pretty spectacular but if you could see what's underneath the water it's the broadness and the vastness yeah. of it you know dad says he was born with dementia and we just got used to it one thing when Sal was a boy he he never wore clothes <laughs> until school started with first grade you know but he never wore clothes at that's all. too long naked so <laughs> His mama told him, said, you're going to have to wear clothes because you, at school, you can't go up there without any clothes on. He said, I'm not wearing. <laughs> so it was quite the ruckus to get him to put, put we didn't wear shoes in that day and age. Uh, so we didn't wear shoes at school, but they made us at least have clothes on. But he, so he balked. He didn't want to do it. So is that where you had the thought God must have a special plan for him because he was difficult and crazy? I will crazy? say this. Si, as you all know, is a very godly man. Yep. I agree with that. Very godly. Yes. So that's good enough for me. <laughs> I told him when he signs his autograph, he needs to go with that First Corinthians passage that says, I said, just put the numbers and let them look it up. Don't say what it is. And it says, if I'm out of my mind, it's for the sake of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that? Second Corinthians 5? 4? Oh, I got my Bible. Yeah, look it up. You got your Bible. I'll look it up. By the way, I, I was noticing Jason's Bible. Those of you that watch the podcast, so the other day he was looking for a, a passage. So he didn't just the whole thing just pulls out, and he they're did. all out of order. And so he's like, he can't find, uh, he said, I said, Jace, I mean, I think it's time for a new Bible when you, when you literally can't find a book in the Bible, but he's still, he's like dad. He has to have the same one. No, I you can't find it? find it. Cause you're putting all this pressure on me. I know. Well, we're just going to wait. Second Corinthians. 
5 and verse 13. I didn't know the numbers, but I knew where it was on the page, which is why I can't get a new Bible. I have a weird mind. It, I know where it is on the section. So you can use that if you have any crazy members in your family. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So, Jay's, I thought we should. So, you brought your duck calls. Uh, we, we, I don't think we've ever <laughs> this? blown. This is, we're, look, when we normally do a podcast, <laughs> we don't go in there and say, let's just pick on Jace the whole time. <laughs> when I don't know what I'm doing, I wear camouflage and I bring my duck calls and my Bible and hopefully my wife, but she came begrudgingly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we're doing a thing after this with The Chosen. And isn't that a good show? Oh yeah, that's good stuff. So we'll Missy and I will see you there later. But so I'm I think not you sure. Should, we've never done I don't think we've ever blown a duck call on the podcast. And since we got people yeah, here. Yes we have. No, I, I blew a I duck think, call on the podcast. No, I've never, never I don't mm-hmm. think we have. Do we have anybody that's watched all the episodes? Yeah, there's some Look, people down front. Have we ever blown duck calls on Jace was right again? <laughs> Leave it to the fans, they know. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why we did. I think I, I'm not sure why we did. Do you remember why? The reason the ducks come up is that going way back, uh, I earned two degrees from Louisiana Tech and uh, over about an eight-year stretch. Not once, not even once did I ever hear the word Jesus while I was being educated for eight years. Not one word. No one used the word Jesus my entire education uh, happening. So when I ran up on Jesus, I repented and I came up with an idea whereby I wanted to use a particular skill set that never came forth while I was being educated. Well, now I've repented and turned to Jesus, the one I knew nothing about, as I was 28. So I told Miss Kay, I said, listen, I held up one of those duck calls. I said, you see that? He said, yeah. I said, that's the only one like it. I had a guy help me, and I showed him what I wanted, and I built my own duck call. You say, but that's no big deal. Well, it's according to how you look at it. Now, I have the help of God, so I can trust in God, I can trust in capitalism, and I can work hard and make duck calls. Because when you live in the woods a lot, like these boys raised up and me, I came out with a keen sense of what birds sound like. You say, well, that's no skill set. Well, I said, Miss Kay, let's find me a place on the river. I said, one way in and one way out. I said, it has to be a flowing stream No lake, has to be a river. If we want to leave, we can go by a boat and go to the Gulf of Mexico. I said, so find me a place on the river and I'm going to fish, catch fish, a fisherman. Fish, I was a man catching fish. So I said, until I get the duck call going and get it on the market, and then you will have some of that long green in your pocket. <laughs> and you left out the crew because you violated every child labor law known to man. I'm so <laughs> my point is, we have the duck calls here. They're part of our life because before we came along, all you had pretty well was mallard hen calls. We built gadwall. That's another duck, a gadwall call. We built wood duck calls. They sound like wood ducks. Do you want me to demonstrate this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what he's going to go through is what we did, and you say, that particular skill set, what did it do for y'all? We're millionaires. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Don't well. tell me the right skill set, trust in God, and, and trust in capitalism won't work. We're, we're not all mil millionaires. <laughs> not all. Yeah. Well, we got some fledglings coming up in the rear. <laughs> <laughs> What's that passage where the dogs were under the table? Yeah, even saying, the dogs get some crumbs. Out. Give me <laughs> your crumbs. Give me your. That explains crumbs. the camouflage, the duck calls. It was a lifestyle we turned into a business, and That's Jason's going to demonstrate. Well, we just we just <laughs> met Mike Lindell, the pillow guy in, in the back, and Dad we said, did. "Hey, you make pillows, I make bird sounds. That's what we're doing here." <laughs> that guy's quite the salesman. I he, wanted he to was, go buy some sheets, he, like he, after he, I talked to him. He gave me the whole commercial, and I said, but I already have one. <laughs> He's like, oh, great. Have you got the sheets? Don't so blow the duck call, Jason. Get out on it. Wait, no, when I said, no, I don't have the sheets, then he was trying to sell me the sheets. Well, I thought that was interesting, you know. He's good. So you got the mallard hen, which does three things. This is the brown version. The green head is the drake. It's weird before I blow this, because I think, because we're, we're in a concrete jungle, I think I have to explain this. It's hard for, for humans to relate to ducks, but in the duck world, the women, the female, do most of the talking. <laughs> the drake only says one thing, but when he does it, he looks around like, did you hear what I said? <laughs> <laughs> so even though it's different, try to relate. But the hen, she does a feed call. She does this when she's eating. She'll go. A little bit like a chicken. She does a content call. She'll do a quack. And when she sees other ducks, she does a greeting call. Which says, come over here. It's safe. You say, how do you know that? Because when we put painted pieces of plastic called decoys that are painted to look like the ducks in front of our spread, and we're all camouflaged, when we make that sound, they stop and come in because they think, oh, there's a party going in. But it wasn't safe. Look, <laughs> then here's what happens. We shoot them. We clean them. We eat them. And Phil left this part out because I believe that what spawned his idea about the duck calls is found in Genesis 9. And so if you don't, if you're not familiar with that, it's actually the birthplace of hunting. Genesis 9, 1 through 4, would y'all agree? Yeah, I agree. Now y'all, I know we're in the concrete jungle here, and a lot of y'all are probably not duck hunters. Do we have any duck hunters in here? There's a few out there. Trust me, that sounded loud, but there was like six hands when I... <laughs> The rest of these people eating chicken nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't have to hunt real hard for that. But God basically told Noah and his family, because it was crazy times back then. You think our culture is bad. It yeah. was a little rougher back then. We're down to one family that's actually trusting in God. And they're having this kumbaya moment on the ark with the animals. Think Lion King, because that's what it was. They weren't wild at that time, because... After the water goes down, God makes an announcement to the animal world. He says, from now on, the fear and dread of you, he was talking to Noah and his family, will fall upon, and he starts naming groups of animals. He says, the beast of the earth, the birds of the air, the crawlers of the ground, and the fish of the sea. I've read this so much that I haven't memorized. Not on purpose, it just I just love it. <laughs> And he said, just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. You say, why do you have five fingers up? According to God, I just gave you the five food groups. Anything that walks, crawls, flies, swims, or grows. And so what did the animal world do in that moment? They ran they ran <laughs> they became wild and so when you walk in the woods if you don't have camouflage on and you're just walking you're like well i don't see anything you know why because they're hiding because god put that wildness in them so that's where hunting began and i think phil's philosophy was i'm going to make duck calls that sound like ducks instead of what happens in the duck hunting world 
for you to make duck calls and sell them, you have to win the world championship, which I do when I go around and do events and do duck call seminars. See, this is actually what I get paid to do, duck call seminars. So you take a call. If you want to go enter the contest in Stuttgart, this is what you need to do. They'll take a duck call. This is supposedly a mallard hen sound, and they'll go... <laughs> And they'll do that longer and longer and longer and longer. It's not annoying, is it? (laughs) Then the next guy steps up, and you're like, what's he going to do? He's going to go there. (laughs) And they just keep seeing who can do it higher, louder, and longer without any break in the notes or until someone passes out. (laughs) They got the CPR team over there. It's pretty cool. The problem is ducks don't do that. Yeah. And so my dad identified that, and he kind of made fun of them, which created a riff and controversy. And my dad is one of those unusual people that he really doesn't mind controversy. <laughs> and so he had his marketing ploy there. He's going to make meat calls. And so then he just started going down the list of ducks. And so the greenhead that does the one thing, he invented this call. And up until this point, a Mallard Drake had never said a word. <laughs> Look, I got a response. Look at here. <laughs> I'm liking this audience. I just got a response. That guy can call. <laughs> and it good. was pretty good. That was the hen responding to the Drake. You see? Y'all I know got we're humans, going. but maybe we can identify. <laughs> see, that's awesome, why I dude. told you we should do a live podcast. That's never going to happen in the studio. I'm going to get a marker after this is over, and I'm going to sign it, and I'm going to find that hen. <laughs> which is actually a dude, which is weird. And I'm gonna give him. (laughs) Never leave home without your woman, your Bible, and your duck call. I brought all three and I'm getting ridiculed. (laughs) (laughs) You're putting out, there's some of the other species. All right, so you got a wood duck. So if you've ever been in the woods at night and heard this. (laughs) Or during the day, and you say, what is that sound? That's a wood duck flying anybody heard that that probably wasn't a wood duck it was someone screaming (laughs) (laughs) so here's what phil did that was interesting with this call what we learned was that people said in the duck world that wood ducks could not be called like mallards you call at them they'll come wood ducks you call at them and they would never come and my dad figured something out a wood duck he only makes that sound when he's flying. So people would make wood duck calls and they would go out and they have painted pieces of plastic decoys. We've gone through that sitting on the water and they use the call flying sound. So when the wood ducks came by, they didn't come in. And the reason is obvious on what the ducks were thinking as they flew by. You probably already guessed it. Stupid. (laughs) That's not real. The ducks are sitting. You wouldn't make the flying sound. So he came up with all the sitting sounds of a wood duck, which they do many sitting sounds. These are a few. They'll go. So what happens in the wild, we'll make, like if a wood duck, we hear them go. Then we'll respond in the blind. We'll go. And then they'll respond. And then we'll respond. We've done it hundreds of times. And guess what? They just come right up to you because they think you're an actual wood duck. And think of the awesome feeling that you convinced a wild animal since Genesis 9 that even though you're a human, that you had this lovely conversation. And then you can have supper with your family and pray to God (laughs) and thank God we're giving you orders from headquarters, right, <laughs> Phil? There you are. So it's organic before organic became cool. Man, that's pretty good. What about that, huh? Yeah. Boy, Jace, you should have a TV show or something. That was really interesting. I got one coming out, and you're responsible, and it's coming. It's a little different than duck calls. This is more about digging in the dirt and finding lost so, uh, that's, secrets. That's a good, so tell, tell folks, why, why do you like digging in the dirt days so i'm curious about that because i don't like digging in the dirt but you do well there's a couple reasons i get one i don't mind being being dirty and muddy i i, I like that no i don't 
I see these people go into car washes and all, and uh, I'm sorry, it may be you people, but like, why would I do that? I'm just gonna get it dirty again, right, babe? This has been a 35 year argument. <laughs> I was like, I wear that mud with pride, so I don't mind Be, I feel more comfortable than I do now being surrounded by concrete. And so that's just one obvious thing. I like being outdoors because you'll notice we're a little different than the other people on this, uh, you know, board of speakers. We, we seem a little different. <laughs> and it's because we discovered God in the, in the outdoors. It, the creation led us to the creator. And so I'm thankful for that because to me, there's way more evidence that there was an intelligent design when you look at the details in the outdoors. It's like, are you kidding me? This sophistication came from nothing, something ignorant. I just, just wasn't buying it, which led us to the Bible. And so how I got into metal detecting was I've read so many stories in the Bible, and Luke 15 is my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. And y'all remember this. I mean, Jesus is eating with the riffraff, tax collectors and sinners, and he's being accused by religious people that if you were really religious, you wouldn't be eating with these people. Why are you doing that? Well, he tells three stories. Well, one of them on why he is interacting and having a meal with sinners. And one of the stories is if a woman loses a coin and i think back in their day some historians have said you know they had a their wedding band sometimes was a necklace that had 10 coins on it they'd be the equivalent of us losing our wedding ring which i have been called to find those <laughs> with my metal detector mm -hmm. but i thought you know if the creator of the universe uses this as an example of finding a lost coin and describing the joy that happens when you find it something of value and the joy also that happens in heaven when the creator of the universe finds his lost sons and daughters if 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 the lord of the universe is using that for an example for to experience joy i need to try that and so i'm telling you i i love to hunt so i think that's one motivation whether it's something I can eat or whether it's something of value that's lost its way that I want to get back going again, that's something valuable that's undiscovered. But I'm going to tell you, when I go out there, it reminds me of how much God pursues us because it's metal detecting is rough. You, you're dirty, you're sweaty. Sometimes it's a strikeout. You're going, you're doing research. You're trying to find places where something lost would be and, I don't know it's just it's a mirror image and a reminder of what god is doing in each one of our lives that's good that's good <clears throat> i that, like this woman we have a woman out here that keeps saying so be it amen thank you sister because i agree it's just awesome how much god pursues us so uh, dad with you i would say in observing you over my life and that's almost 50 years of my observation of you that you're passionate about two things or primarily ducks is one and sharing jesus would be the other one and not necessarily in that order but that's your two passions why is that why do you think that is i lived such a sinful life that when i finally sat down sobered up and listened to the message the guy drew it out in diagrams and he drew an arrow on a piece of paper an arrow coming down he said that's when God became flesh at the time it wasn't too th that's been uh, 47 48 years ago but when I zeroed in on the the fact that we're all counting time by Jesus of Galilee all the years before Jesus got here are called all the years before Jesus got here. <laughs> and all the years after Jesus got here are called A.D., Anno Domini, year of our Lord. So for the first time in my life when I heard that, we're in point one of the gospel. God becoming 
flesh. Now it's 2,021 years ago. Your calendar is right in front of you. I got Dan the eunuch. He works for me. He's Kay's butler. And the only reason we call him a eunuch is he has chosen not to marry. So instead of ragging him about it, he has every right to say, I'm not getting married. I did tell him it'd be a lot cheaper. <laughs> no doubt there. So you got an arrow coming down out of heaven, God becoming flesh. I had him call that girl that knows everything on the computer. I don't have a computer. I never use one or a cell phone. But somebody said, that Alexa, I think was her name. I said, call Alexa, or whoever she was. And I said, ask her, what year is it in Red China, in China? And Alexa said, 2021. <laughs> I said, huh? I said, ask her what year is it in uh, Russia? She said, Alexa says, 2021. <laughs> I said, what about uh, North Korea? 2021. So I'm thinking, everybody's counting time by Jesus. I would think you would at least, anybody, investigating, because right after he came, Roughly 33 years later, he dies on a cross, and that's what the guy wrote next to him becoming flesh. His death was on a cross for the sins of the world. All of your past sins will be removed, and if you come to Jesus, none of your future ones would be counted against you. They killed him. Start in Matthew. I did this morning so I could be pretty precise at least 10 different times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus said, we're going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed to the hands of, of wicked men, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They're going to kill me. And in three days, I'll be raised from the dead. He said it. Matthew said he said it. Mark said he said it. Luke said he said it. And John said he said it, and guess what they all four recorded? Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead, just like he had said he was going to do, over and over and over. To me, you say, that's the gospel. All your sins will be removed, guaranteed you can. It was impossible for death to hold its, take a hold of him, if you come to Jesus, it's impossible for death taking hold on you. You're like, good, not a living. Man. We're talking immortality here. So you got immortality riding on it. After he was raised from the dead, he spent 40 days, according to Luke in Acts chapter 1, 40 days, to convince them he was alive, showed doubting Thomas where, the, where he was pierced, showing him what happened, letting him look at him, and they were just stunned. Thomas dropped down in front of him and said, my Lord and my God, I said I wasn't going to believe this unless I saw it. Good night, you, you, you're beating death. He conquers death for the human race. Forty days he stays, and he goes back to sit down at the right hand of the Father where there's constant mediating work, the blood, forgiving you of any sin you'll ever commit because you're no longer under law of works but grace. If you got a better story, America, I'm looking at what America's doing now, and I'm thinking, wow, they so mean to each other, lying, stealing, shooting, looting, burning, running. I'm like, what in the world? There's no Jesus there. All he wants out of us is to love him, for crying out loud. I would think so. And love each other. How hard can it be? I mean, so I don't want to preach you a little sermon. Actually, I did want to preach you a little sermon, and I did it. I think you just but did it. Yeah. Faith in that, by the way, and we take them down the river and we baptize them because Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations and baptize them. So when we come down there, we share what I, you just heard. If you say thousands have said that, I saw a couple of bass fishermen one time coming, and I had about three or four some girls out of one of these rehab homes. They were standing on the bank, 
and one was out there, I was standing in the river with her, and I had fixed to baptize her, and I looked up, and I saw two, a, a boat coming with a couple of bass fishermen, you know, throwing against the bank. When they saw, saw everybody standing in the water there, you know, they thought, what in the world? I said, I said, hey, y'all want to get in on some of this action? Ooh, <laughs> boy, did they take off. <laughs> I don't think they were quite ready. Want that. So what about you, Zach? What are you passionate about these days? Me? Uh, well, we're working on a feature film um, that's going to be about Phil and Kay's life, the first 28 years of their life. If you hadn't heard their testimony, it's pretty I powerful. I told them I didn't like that because it, it was so embarrassing. Is this going to be rated R? Or? Well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah, it's depending on how, how realistic it well, is. Somebody said, you, you got to really, uh, are you guys kind of like really going to jazz it up a little bit? No, I'm trying to jazz it down. I'm just saying say that because I had a lot of sins, but I will say this after me telling you I had a lot, I'm betting so did you. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, Phil, Phil said, he read the uh, quote from the Apostle Paul who said, I'm the chief of all sinners. He said, so it could be worse. Uh, it could be. But yeah, we're working yeah. on that right now. Um, we got another podcast, uh, a couple of other podcasts we're, we're doing. But um, but I guess what I'm passionate about, we just we just adopted a, a little baby. So that's new, you know, number five. Yeah. So we've talked about that on the yeah, podcast. Pretty awesome. Baby Ruth. Ba- ba- baby Ruth was born on Easter uh, they had to revive her back to life, um, and um, she was two pounds, five ounces, and one of the nurses brought, brought us a king-size Baby Ruth bar and put it right next to her. So I got a picture of her with the Baby Ruth bar. So Baby Ruth was the same size as the Baby Jace, Ruth bar. You've, you've uh, adopted a little girl, right? Yeah. And Willie, uh, he's adopted, adopted one or two. <laughs> Semantics. Y'all did a good yeah. deed for those kids. Well, you know, she was from Nicaragua. We were we were helping her out, and we just had this moment. Oh, we we shared this on last podcast. She was so proud that she's gotten a job, and she sent a picture of her little office space. And Missy and I was talking. It's like, what? Why? Why is that such a big deal? And I was like, you know, you think of a girl born in a third world country who lost her parents. Who was raised by her grandma, who she, who who died. Her only connection with having a mentor was a guy who's a believer in Jesus. And he just noticed we have an orphan girl, and he just poured the love of Christ in her, and and encouraged her not to give up, not to be a statistic. And so this girl, via the internet, educates herself, devotes herself to the Lord and has a bumpy life and looks up and she's stranded because a civil war broke out in the country she's from. She can't get back in. She literally has the clothes on her back. And the guy who mentored her called our church and said, is there anybody you can think of that can help this girl? And uh, back then it was kind of, even though she had a visa to come in uh, because she got a scholarship, to a college university here it was at that time yet she was still in high school and uh i missy and i said hey let's get her in the country and that was back you know when the trumps uh were in office and i i'm was friends with don trump jr through her hunting and and relationship with helping kids with cleft lip and palate and i thought you know if i have to use my one phone call i'm using it over this girl Mm -hmm. Because we're getting her out of that, but it never came to that. But once I met her and got to know her and saw her heart, we had a conversation one day. It was about three months into it. I said, look, you don't have any parents. We don't have a Nicaraguan daughter. (laughs) I said, we would like to be your parents. And she said, yes, please. (laughs) Yeah, it was awesome. Um, and so she uh, she gets me teared up sometimes because she just has no maliciousness about her, mm. and she's grateful for everything she has. But above all, she won't take anything unless she feels like she's done something to earn it. But she's just a hard worker. She she's fixed to graduate college, and uh, we've been with her for years. And I, I mean, she's my daughter, but uh, she's more than that. She's a sister for Jesus and a warrior. 
Hey, ma'am. It's good. <clears throat> but I, I always gravitate toward uh, people, and I got this from Jesus, not in a seminar somewhere, but when, because I'll go to events, and there'll be hundreds of people like today, and it tends to be overwhelming, and I've told you all on previous podcasts, my number one fear is public speaking, and you're like, huh? Yeah, number two is flying, and, this, and I'm going all over and doing this. But when I notice what Jesus did in the Gospels is he picked out these little moments between just individuals that had huge, powerful things that came out of that. I mean, I think about the Samaritan woman, and she became the spokesperson there, and later on in Acts, you see all these people are converted because she, she planted the seed. Mm-hmm. And so I look for these moments at these events with individuals, and it's usually people that have every reason in the world to give up or quit. There's something wrong with them physically or whatever, and I meet them, and I, I just try to pour into them in this moment because I think, man, the rest of us been blessed. You look at all the things that happen. Here's a person who has extreme difficulty and has every reason in the world just to say, I give. But they not only refuse to do so, but they're usually the most smiling, the most encouraging. And I'm like, you know, Romans 5, I think about that passage, you know. They've been through all this suffering, and somehow they found their comfort in Jesus who can make all things possible. And that's what keeps me going in these these moments. So So I think uh, adoption is one of those huge components for in the pro-life you know, we, we're pro-life, but you got to have Christians who are willing to adopt children. Uh, that's part of it. Of course, we have to have a message out there. We have to be able to, uh, you know, help more girls get ultrasound so they'll hear that heartbeat um, and not want to take that life. And so there's so much that we do kind of working together. That's one of the passions Lisa and I uh, currently have is in the pro-life movement. I think it's probably as good as it's been since this whole nightmare started back in the 70s because of technology, number one, it's easier now to be able to, it's hard to look inside that womb at it's, it's such an early age and say, that's not a baby, that's not a child, that's not a little boy or a little girl. And then the other thing is, I think we now as Christians have really put pro-love back in the pro-life movement. Uh, we, were, we were much more on the protest side, you know, a few decades ago, and that's understandable because it's a terrible thing. But it's much better when we can love people and try to help them make better decisions. And I think that's what our pregnancy centers and many of you are doing. So I just want to give a big thumbs up to all of you involved in the pro-life movement because it's worth it to save kids. I'm also getting, for years, you know, I worked at our church, I preached. uh, We had another guy and he and I co-pastored together. And it was really neat because we always used to say we had two preachers for the price of two preachers. And because that's what it was, you know, we just did it together. Well, now, ironically, for the last year and a half, we volunteer preach. So now we have two preachers for the price of no preachers, <laughs> which is great for the church. But I'm loving it. It's been a lot of fun to preach without that pressure of working for the church. I feel like I can just really dive into the word and that be the ministry. The beautiful thing, thanks to Blaze TV, is that we with my studies of preaching, we're able to do the same studies on the podcast. And so that's no accident that we did the book of John or the way we did Old Testament. That's that's a nice way of saying we're basically giving you all your material for your sermons every Sunday. (laughs) That's how I took that. That's how it's turned out, though, right? Well, except I don't use y'all's material because mine's far (laughs) superior. But no, actually, actually, Jace is right. I I learn a lot of being able to to study the Bible, you know, with Jason, Dad, and Zach when he's with us on a regular basis. We just had a guy in for... Uh, one of our teachers at WFR for Romans 9. And it was just, I mean, I learned a lot. Oh, yeah, it was good. I mean, we needed, Romans 9 through 11 is difficult. Yeah. And when you, what are we, uh, have we concluded that we're all C, I'm a D plus, feels a C plus. I think I'm a B plus. Y'all keep pulling me in the C plus. I'm a little bit higher than that. You were pretty smart I was pretty smart. I I I got Jace through preaching school. I'm perfectly happy with C plus (laughs) because that means I'm smarter than half of them. (laughs) <laughs> but they say what about the other half that are smarter than you i said i don't live with it <laughs> so, i try to be street smart which is important i mean because i think if you know jesus it makes you smarter smart enough 
Yeah, I mean, you just think about it. I mean, I, I think Noah Webster had a point when he said education is useless without the Bible. Yeah. And he came up with our dictionary. I mean, that was that was his point. Because really, when Phil went through the gospel all ago, and y'all applauded, which I'm glad you did, you're thinking about how smart that makes you. If there's a way to get forgiveness for everything you've ever done wrong, and then there's a way to live forever that you actually can participate in, and there's a way to have God's awesome power inside of you to give you a purpose on this earth, that pretty makes you that pretty well makes you the smartest person on the planet. <laughs> and dangerous <laughs> that's right you know I, I you know that we we had a al wanted to talk about these life-changing moments because we all had that when we came to jesus but being in jesus is filled with life-changing moments and one of them personally i had i'm going to that part if we want, we'd like to go is that when i was part of an emergency landing on a plane i noticed fairly quickly that i was the most calm person on the plane because to me death is real i'm not living in this delusion that i'm not going to die one day and phil's famous line you know he's like people live in that delusion because they eat right and they work out and he'll he always says you'll die healthy (laughs) (laughs) but we just always think it's not going to happen to me and so they're like the plane's going down and you know what happened mass chaos and I thought, well, okay, here we go. Because if you believe this is real, that's just part of it. And it does make you dangerous. And so Apostle I, Peter J. said he, he, when he talked about his physical death coming up, he alluded to it as a departure, not a passing away. Exactly. A departure. There's a big difference. Exactly yeah. right. I mean, we all think back to when we heard we're introduced to Jesus and we're real careful about what we say there. Cause a lot of people, this is just a book. What so, makes it so powerful is that you're pointing people to the author that he orchestrated woven through history. I mean, when I came to Jesus, the first thing I did is tried to get around this. But the more I studied, I thought, and the more I looked at creation, I'm like, no, I, I, I think I'm in on this. <laughs> it just, the promises outweighed the alternative out in the world. But like I say, we always have those, those life changing moments. And when you said it makes you dangerous, I was so scared of persecution because I was came to Christ when I was 14 and it was so difficult to live for Jesus as a teenager. Cause I went to a public school and everybody used filthy language. Everybody was sleeping on their girlfriend. Everybody was getting drunk. I mean, I just had no, church group and phil and Kay had started a little country church out where we were from but there it was small i mean nobody lived out there and so i didn't really have any christian friends and i just felt alone and awkward i mean but i knew this was right so i just my whole christian life for two years was just not doing wrong but most of you people that that read your bible well that's not what this is about that kind of comes with it, but it's who you represent. And the more I studied, the more I looked at this, the more dangerous. I like when you said that I became, and I thought, what, what am I doing sitting here being persecuted by a bunch of people who have no hope, have no alternative, have no purpose. And so when I opened up and went public with Jesus, that's when I started figuring it out because their response was so shocking. Mm -hmm. So I came up with the three questions, you know, what I got, I got, I got three questions for y'all. And if y'all answer them better than I can, I'll go get drunk with you. Well, that got everybody's attention. So I'm like, how did you get on the earth? They're all looking at each other. My mom, which was funny, (laughs) but I'm like, how, where did the life come from? What are we doing here? How are we leaving? How are we getting off the earth? Of course, you know what they said then. He's crazy, which made me dangerous. Uh 
And uh, I share their story in, in the speeches, though. <laughs> that night, none of them responded to Jesus. They all thought I was crazy. They all thought I was dangerous. But through the years, whenever they hit bottom, guess who they contacted? It always went back to that conversation because there was no alternative. There was no answers. So I saw a buddy of mine who, who showed up. We got him a back, backstage pass earlier. We've told his story a couple times on the podcast. He was the guy who came over to the party house, but he didn't realize the guy who lived there had, had just come to Jesus. He came there. He saw all the vehicles out because we were studying with another guy. And he's like, hey, what are y'all doing? It scared him. So he's like, I'm not interested. He goes in the, the next room and starts playing video games. And he just overheard what Phil shared earlier about Jesus, about the author. Came out, the guy we were studying with, we figured out his name a while ago because we were talking about it. He wasn't interested. And this guy, Kevin, said, I want in on that. And like an idiot, I thought, in on what? He's like, what you shared? And so I thought in my mind, I thought, well, there's no way he can respond without a relationship. There's no way. So I started asking him, well, why do you want to respond? And then it just poured out of him on what he just heard about God becoming flesh in Jesus and he died for my sins. He raised, I want, I want to go to heaven. I want in on this. Good. I was like, okay. <laughs> Come on, and I mean, here we are. How many years ago was that? Like a number on that. Do I, we? I put it in one of my books, Jace. You tell me that out, man. A conversion story. I put it in one of my books. Some of you might have read it, but one day the phone rang, and I said, "Duck Commander." That's when I was answering the phone, and and he he <laughs> said, "I need to order a duck call." In the process of him ordering that duck call, he used God's name in vain about five times. <laughs> yeah. Well, about the fifth time as I'm jotting down, you know, where I'm going to send it and all, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, why do you keep cursing the only one who can save you from death, give you immortality? And he said, hey, you got my duck call coming? I said, yeah, on the way. Boom. Well, 10 <laughs> minutes goes up. by. 10 minutes goes by. Phone rings. Yeah, duck commander. He said, hey. He said, I never thought about that. I said, well, I said, I looked at his, what I just written down. I said, you from Alabama. I said, you know what you ought to do? I said, I'll make you a bet. Drive over here. It's about an eight, nine hour drive. I said, drive over here and I'll tell you why you shouldn't be cursing God. And he said, well, I just might do that. And I said, well, you are too. A week goes by, knock on the door. I said, come in. And I look over and this dude steps in, had another guy with him. And he said, you know who I am? I said, I don't believe I ever met you. He said, I was that guy that's cursing God. I want to know why I shouldn't do it. I said, you have come to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> they sat out on my living room floor. <laughs> I told them about Jesus, walked down on the river. When they said, Jesus is Lord, I said, I'm glad you drove by, man. I said, it's kind of an interesting way to get you here. I said, but the Lord's got plans for you. So I baptized them. I said, y'all want to get some dry clothes? They said, oh, no, we all right. They left wet, yeah. took off toward Alabama. 17 years goes by. I'm speaking at an engagement, a church in Alabama. And when I got over there, some guy, I was eating a little meal with the preacher before the proceedings. And some guy walked up and he said, Robinson, you remember that guy that on the phone that was cursing God and you, you called him out on it? I said, yeah, I remember him. I said, he was from Alabama. He said, he's one of the leaders of this church now. Mm. Huh. I thought, there you go. Yeah. That's one of many stories I could tell you, but that's just, cool. uh, we could all tell you a lot of stories about conversions, but yeah. there's been some wild ones. So How that, many years was that? Did we determine? 1990? 1990? Wow. And he's one of the best friends in the world. 30 he, years he ago. And he's Lord, here today. So. And, uh, yeah, that deserves applause. Go for it. We figured out how to phrase that because I said he came to Jesus on accident, but actually that would be dumb to say because God had a plan. But he heard the message on what seemed to be an accident. 
<laughs> which so, I was thinking about that passage in, in Romans 10, which we're about to get to on the podcast. In verse 14, it said, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Yeah. And I think that's where we all know it. If we, we talk about living an unashamed life in Christ, that's what it is. I mean, and it's consistent and it's real and we live it and we breathe it and we talk about it. And it's part of who we are every single day. I think that's why you guys love the podcast is it's just authentic, real people who study and share the word of God and help people's lives. I told uh, the pillow guy earlier, I said, Mike, I don't, I know they're after you. I mean, all these corporations are trying to kill his business and ruin him and all this. And I said, but you got to realize something. Your sins were canceled on the cross. Canceled there. And so nobody can cancel you now. No matter what they try to do to you, business-wise and all that, you keep standing up for Jesus, you ain't got to worry about any of that stuff. You are uncancelable yep. if you're in yeah. Christ. So you don't have to worry about all that. That's it. Well, I think, too, uh, when people, when I mean, you hear about, us sharing our hearts and saying, you know, like I'm scared of the public and all, but what I realized in all that and like why I shared that story, you know, with my friend is that you realize in those moments that it's not about you. I mean, I didn't know him. He just overheard God's plan for his life and responded. It takes the pressure off of you. It made me think of second Corinthians four and verse five. It says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourself as servants. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And then I love verse seven. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. And so that's what we do. I mean, when you realize that God uses flawed people to make known his son you conclude that he uses us all in our own ways to make jesus look great and trust me the planet needs it mm. it does so you know part of the reason why we're able to be here with you guys today but also have this podcast is uh when when blaze approached us and gaston and said hey we'd like to do a podcast you know with phil initially because dad has a show on blaze called in the woods with phil and it's basically just him living his life every single day and doing what he does and you get to kind of follow him around and see that and of course there's going to be some good sermons in there too because that's what dad does right every day and he talked to us about podcasts we didn't know much about podcasts we're kind of in that not quite the age range that really loves podcasts and so we said well is this like because a lot of their people on the platform are you know conservative political stuff and they said well what do you want to do? What would we do? And they said, well, just do Bible, do what you guys do. And we're like, do Bible, man, we're all over that. And so they've given us an opportunity to basically have a Robertson Bible study and put it out there for the whole world. I'm so grateful that we get that opportunity to be able to do that. I realize now as a kid growing up, as Zach was describing earlier before we came out, that when we were sitting around the dinner table or sitting in the living room at the house we grew up in where dad and mom still are, we were, that was the early beginnings of the Unashamed Podcast. Yeah, it was. Because that's what we were doing. And, and we all even knew as kids, you know, because my grandpa was there, my grandma, and then my cousins would come in. And when you got your opportunity to say something, because I know people are always, oh, y'all interrupt each other all the time. But that's the way we did it. That's, it doesn't, we don't offend each other because if you got a good point, you got to get in there and make it. Well, right? yeah. I mean, I, I think when, when he was saying about prep time for the podcast, I was like, that's about five minutes. <laughs> and now, before that scares you off, I believe First Peter three fifteen with all my heart, which says, "Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect." And so, really, we've been prepared for this since I was fourteen. Right. Because we have spiritual conversations, we have Bible discussions, sometimes arguments over things that doesn't really matter. But I'm like, if I'm right, I'm right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> but 
But that's we, why I tell James all the time. Just because you believe your way is right doesn't mean that your being wrong is going to change our relationship. I mean, I think that's I still love you, exactly. You're my brother, even though. But that's why it's okay. You know, we we get the big stuff right, and you can have really passionate discussions. And a lot of times, you'll notice on the podcast we don't agree, but we agree on the big stuff, which is that it's about Jesus and His grace. It's about the resurrection and us being a forever family. And you acknowledge that we're flawed and we're sinful. And if you all acknowledge that, well, sometimes you're going to get it wrong. So I think our churches, this is my opinion, but for the most part, they just try to splinter off and get everything right and and try to agree on every little thing. And this is a big book and you're never going to pull that off. It's just not yep. going to happen. So yep. if that's your goal, what happens is you see a lot of groups that don't like each other and they argue and they're not reaching out to the world introducing Jesus, which is what we should be doing. And that's easy to understand. Yeah, the unashamed part, Jace, one of the things I would love to see happen. Now, I have, this is quite thick. This, this, these sheets are quotes from your found founding fathers and mine. Listen to the way the presidents were talking back in the day when the country was founded. Here's George Washington talking to somebody in a letter. You do well to wish to learn our arts and ways of life, and above all, the religion of Jesus Christ. These will make you a greater and happier people than you are. While we are jealously performing, here's something else, the duties of good citizens and soldiers, him being a general, we certainly ought not to be inattentive to the higher duties of religion. To the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. Look, George Washington, first president, but Here's, I think it's people with they had people have bad religious experiences. I mean, they or were they say, well, these men were were flawed. Yeah, and which they were because we all are. But when people go to the New Testament and they read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is what I encourage people to do at the end of the day, and you look at the character of Jesus, you will not find one thing wrong. Nothing. It's amazing. People can have this bad religious experience or, or they, you know, they, they look at our past and say, yeah, but these were flawed men and look at what they did. But you, when you challenge somebody to find the flaw in Jesus, when they read it for themselves, they think, huh, there's not one thing wrong with anything he ever did or said. And he was always trying to do things for the better of other people. And I think that's what our religious leaders and our political leaders back in the day realized that. They're like, we want these qualities. We want this character in our country. And so we know that's what happened. When you, when you look at what happened to getting God out of the school, well, what happened? So did those qualities, a lot of those qualities left with it. And so you're like, well, how come these kids are acting this way? Because you threw out God and the characteristics that make people awesome. Seems we're running a little low on people. Here's John Adams. Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only book and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. What a utopia, what a paradise this region would be. I've examined all religions. And the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. Second Amen. president. So I think my good. point is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have drifted. We have drifted away from God to now we're being chastised and called idiots. But we're, what we're saying by quoting George Washington and John Adams and all the rest of them, I mean, it's, uh, it's a sad thing to watch, and I hope there's a mass repentance on America's part before it's too late. I think there's uh, people say, well, we have so many complex issues, 
uh, going on today and you know it's going to take complex solutions but not really really forgiveness is the answer to what ails america if we can forgive for past forgive in the present and forgive in the future because jesus and god forgave us then that makes us live totally different so if you want to unite people you do it in forgiveness people that have been harmed and hurt and betrayed if they're able to say but you know what we can move forward and And that's what it does and it's not just those who are outside of jesus you know a lot of our the people that came over out of religious freedom and started this country then built a building and enslaved themselves for rule oriented christianity i'm like you came here to be free and now you locked yourself up with a few people in a building and are a million miles away from god's grace and i think that's what i hope to be a part of in in the podcast is that when you get the point of this you conclude that god is for you not against you uh i shared because we were talking about the name of our podcast and you know it comes from romans 1 16 where paul said i'm not ashamed of the gospel it's a power of salvation for everyone who believes first for the jew then for the gentile that's everybody but in romans 4 he uses abraham as an example of our the father of our faith because he trusted and left his past and left his future by being willing to give up isaac but in hebrews 11 there's a there's a little phrase there that i've been bringing up a lot because through the holy spirit the hebrew writer says that god is not ashamed to call us sons Mm -hmm. and daughters Mm -hmm. and really that's that's the way this works we're not ashamed of him out there because despite our baggage and crap in our life god is not ashamed of us that's why he sent jesus and then you're back to this message of grace and to me that's my motivation for being out loud and proud is because he's out loud and proud for me and he proved it by what he did through history in jesus well the uh, as ernie miles used to say the clock on the wall says that's all y'all uh, we are out of time for Unashamed. We want to thank NRB for uh, hosting us and allow us to come do our podcast live. You guys are the first ones ever to see an Unashamed podcast live. So thank yeah, y'all for being awesome. here. There you go. We want to encourage you guys to live unashamed for Jesus Christ. Do it every day. Love y'all.